Hi, I'm Donna Davis. I'm here with Justin O'Dell, who is an attorney with O'Dell, O'Neill, Hungerford, and Blanchard. And today we've got a really interesting show. There's one topic that has just been in the news so much lately. Yeah, good morning. So, uh, good morning. you know, originally we had sort of thought about a few other things, but with the news lately, uh, and given what we do, we do probate uh, work, conservatorships, and guardianships. It seems like we've all got to get an understanding of what's happening to Brittany and mm -hmm. free Brittany and, and what all is going with that. There's a lot of confusion out there, a lot of things people don't understand, a lot of questions, and, and some of it in a very good way because it's caused people to, to understand what conservatorships are, how they operate, um, and uh, when, when they might need to be uh, looking at a conservatorship. So uh, it, it is a very interesting uh, dynamic. Before you go into that, I want to know, I've heard of guardianships, so can you kind of tell me what's sure. the difference between it, a guardianship and a yeah. conservatorship? Yeah, and so a lot of the confusion comes because uh, when I first started practicing law, it's been 20 years now, but when I first started practicing law, we referred to everything under the phrase guardianship. And so we had a guardianship of the person and a guardianship of the property. And when I started practicing law, that's, that's what it was. So it was all a guardianship, and then it was just whether the person was charged with, with making decisions for somebody's welfare, which would be a guardian of the person, or making decisions about their assets, which would be a guardian of the property. Some years ago, uh, it's been at least 10 or 12 or more now, they revised the probate code, and when they revised that, they decided to get rid of kind of the confusing nomenclature, and a guardianship now in Georgia and in most states, a guardianship deals with uh, the person charged with the welfare of a ward. So the ward is the person under the guardianship, and the guardian is the person that helps make decisions about them personally, medical decisions and, and other things. A conservator, conservatorship, is charged with the, with the assets of the ward. So they're charged with helping them make financial decisions. So although rare, uh, we do have situations where somebody could be under a financial or asset-based conservatorship, but not necessarily under a guardianship, or they have a conservator in place and a more or less restrictive guardian in place because they're pretty functional. Of course, the typical thing with this is uh, what you would think, right? Elderly parent, elderly grandparent, maybe we've got some onset dementia. Uh, Alzheimer's, those types of things, people living longer. And the other thing we see, of course, is the world is more complicated, right? So time gone by, uh, let's say grandma went to uh, the bank and had somebody with her and was going to write out a check to cash, right? Well, the bank officer, who was a community banker, probably knew grandma and probably knew everybody in the family yeah. and would pick up the phone and say, hey, uh, mom was in here today and she had somebody with her that we didn't recognize and we made up a reason not to complete the transaction. You might want to help her out. Uh, likewise, if you went into a physician or other doctor without any paperwork, it was probably somebody that was familiar uh, and they would say, okay, well, let me talk to you about what's going on with your mother or your grandmother or whatever. The world today is a whole lot more complicated and a whole lot less personal. It is. I never even thought about that, and but so, that does bring in so many other right, possible you, problems. And there's people that are constantly trying to get money out of people and calling right. jobs and the internet and everything. And, and so just think about something that you and I would do that's relatively, should be relatively simplistic, right? Changing your insurance carrier, mm -hmm. dealing with uh, banks, dealing with um, the IRS, dealing with a health insurance provider on a dispute over payment for a medical bill, right? Those things are a headache for you and I now. Yes. Think about if you have somebody who's elderly. My grandmother, till the day she died, did not own a computer or had never been on the Internet. So think about somebody in that position trying to make and work through some of those decisions. Yeah. It's a lot easier for them to be taken advantage of. It's a lot easier for them to make mistakes. There's a lot of scams out there. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to be under a conservatorship. But that's what we see now is the balancing act between where do people use powers of attorney and things to help people out versus conservatorships. And the magic is a power of attorney extends your power. So I have the power to do certain things, and I can extend that power to another person, but I haven't lost it. Oh, a conservatorship okay. extends the power to another person, 
but at the same time terminates it in the, in the ward. So it cuts off their right to go buy a car or their right to bank or their right to do anything. And in Britney Spears' case, her rights to reproduce, to do the so very fundamentals her, of life. Her, her case is, is very unusual, obviously, for a lot of reasons. The celebrity aspect of it is, is one thing. But, uh, you know, there's no doubt that at some point in her life there was a mental health breakdown, and I don't think anybody disputes that. But the thing has carried on now for a period of time. And what seems to have happened is that we have drifted away, in her case, from whether she's capable of making decisions. And everybody seems now to just think, well, she's going to make bad decisions. And she has the right to make bad decisions. I mean, just because we think she would not be responsible doesn't mean she meets the standard for a guardian and a conservatorship, and she should have that voice. She's capable of working and earning millions of dollars performing. She's performed in Las Vegas and employed people and kept millions of, earned millions of dollars and paid out millions of dollars. And at some level, we use the phrase in Georgia, the probate courts use the phrase in Georgia, the least restrictive conservatorship or the least restrict that the ward is entitled to the least restrictive imposition. They should maintain as much of their rights and their dignity and their abilities as the court can allow them. And so in her case, it seems to have gotten blurred a little bit where we're not deciding, is she capable of making decisions? We seem to be thinking to ourselves, well, she's just going to make really bad ones, and so we need to keep this in place. And that, that really isn't the standard. Uh, the big event yesterday, of course, is she now has been granted, which is a, a very powerful thing, she's been granted the right to hire her own lawyer. That's good. That she chooses which will be a person that she trusts that can advocate for her, who's charged with advocating for her and representing her interests. Um, that may be to petition to modify the conservatorship, terminate the conservatorship, remove her father as the conservator and appoint a new conservator, but she will be granted that voice. A, a lot of people wonder after she spoke last time why the judge didn't do anything, and part of the reason was there was no petition on the table for the judge to act. So the judge, although heard from her, didn't really have anything to grant or deny that she'd requested. She's now been given that right to come back and, and make that request in a formal way. That's good. And, and that's important to know here. So we have situations, and, and I've been involved in situations, where there's a, a periodic impairment, uh, a mental health impairment. Uh, somebody has some kind of psychiatric event, uh, a stroke, uh, is a very, an onset stroke as opposed to a, a debilitating stroke where the person recovers. Um, we do see situations where people have some kind of breakdown or, or other issue, and we have a, a conservatorship that's imposed or a guardianship that's imposed for a shorter period of time. And then after a period of time, the person regains themselves or regains their cognitive abilities. They uh, recover, rehab, or whatever it is, and they're able to come back, petition, and modify or terminate their own conservatorship. And so, uh, you know, those, those things happen here. Um, uh, children, uh, people don't think about it, but one of the conservatorships and guardianships that we deal with, you know, fairly frequently, people that have a child who's got a, a developmental or a mental or a physical impairment, when that child is a minor, the child uh, is under their parents' control, obviously. But when that child turns 18, they're an adult for all legal and practical and other purposes. And so we help parents go into the probate court right around that child's 18th birthday and get them under a guardianship and a conservatorship so that they can continue to help that child. Now, it may be by the time that child, because of whatever mental or physical developmental delays exist, maybe by the time they're 26, 27, 28, they can progress to a point that they manage their own affairs, but they may need a little longer, and parents can work through that, that process. So any time, I mean, <laughs> you see this in movies, you see it all the time, that anybody who another person takes any control over, there's usually conflict there. I mean, there are very few people that want to say, even elderly people who, you know, can't keep track of things, there are very few people who want to say, oh yeah, I realize that I need your help with sure. this. Do you, and in your firm, have you seen cases where it has 
like a lot of conflict oh, yes. with that. We've, and we've, we've done a lot of contested guardianship work on, on all sides. One, the, the elderly person with sometimes with resources, money, fighting against the children trying to do what, what's best for them and even what the court ultimately thinks is best for them. Uh, the other popular one, of course, is not popular as in popular, but popular as in frequent. Uh, the other one is, you know, which child is going to be the conservator. And, you know, part of the importance of this, obviously, is there are documents, powers of attorney and uh, what we call an advanced directives form and other documents you can put in place in advance that tells the court, if something happens, these are the people that I want making these decisions for me. And if people will do that in advance, they'll avoid a lot of this on the back end. But to your point, think about it. How hard is it to have the conversation about let's not drive anymore Absolutely. with an elderly parent, Absolutely. right? Just, just getting the car keys back from them yes. when, you, when everybody knows that's the right decision. Yeah. Well, now go to them and tell them, by the way, I need you to turn over financial control and other things because you're not really right. capable of making the right decisions. It's a very hard conversation. Parents are very resistant to it. Um, there's a generational issue that we see. Um, there are generations of people now who are very elderly. We're on kind of the back end of the greatest generation, trending into the baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. And those are two generations that were raised with the concept, and we've all heard it right, we don't talk about money at home. Yeah. Right? It yeah. was a very closed door driven. Uh, it's not something we discuss. And so now a, a child who is uh, maybe in their 50s or 60s with a parent in their 70s, 80s, or maybe even 90s was raised with the idea we don't talk about this stuff. Right. And so it's very uncomfortable and very hard for them to then go to their parent. And our, our statement is they have to parent their parent. Right. And uh, it's a very difficult conversation to broach with the parent. It's a very hard thing to do, but it's a very important thing to do. We have seen all kinds of scams out there. And, you know, it, it's, it's a conversation that's better had 30, 30 minutes too early rather than 30 days too late. Um, and so... So you've seen situations where people, I mean, I don't know, in your law firm or just are you talking about out in public that you hear about these things where elderly people are taken advantage of? Oh, but both. have you actually seen oh, it yeah. in your we've, firm? We've handled cases where we've helped elderly. I had an elderly couple that we helped recover money that a, a broker just stole a, uh, uh, through a pretty elaborate scheme. And when you look at it, any logical person probably would have fallen for it. They weren't overly demented or susceptible or anything like that. It seemed on its face to be fine. When you walked it back, there were a million red flags that I could point out. But, yeah. you know, you see exactly how it happened. And so those things are becoming more and more frequent. The the online presence, get, you know, my grandfather, who just turned 99 I last saw week. I saw that. Granddad was turned, great, by the way. <laughs> that's right. Uh, World War II veteran. My granddad turned 99. The amount, my mother talk, talks about all the time, the amount of stuff that comes in because she has to help monitor his um, email because of the amount of stuff that comes in of people that are sent. They figured out he's elderly and, and they're trying to um, take advantage of him. And uh, she says it's just remarkable how sophisticated it is. And, you know, and so all of those conversations are very important, even if it's not a conservatorship, even if it's a power of attorney or just a conversation about having people involved. Um, you talked about conflict. This is my PSA. I do this for lots okay. of things. Please, let me just tell everybody, spread the word. In Georgia, if you put somebody on a bank account as a co-owner, they are the recipient of that account. It creates, by presumption, what is called a joint account with a right of survivorship, meaning when the person dies, the other owner of the account gets it 100% automatically. And for husbands and wives and married couples and domestic partners and everything else, that's fine. That's usually what they want to have happen. What we see all the time is mom or grandma puts one child on the oh account with gosh, her to, I see where this is going. to pay the bills. <laughs> There's two more kids out there. There's two more kids out there. And then as time goes by, they start pulling money out of mom's IRA and it goes in that account. They sell mom's house and it goes in that account. And then what happens is uh, mom dies and the will leaves everything to all three kids equally. But there's nothing in the will 
it's now all in this bank account, and it's all now owned by one child. Now, sometimes that child says, well, that's obviously not what was supposed to happen. We didn't know this. Um, I'll split it equally with my siblings. Other times they don't, and I've been involved in cases where they don't. And they say, nope, that's exactly what mom wanted to have happen because I was the one taking care of her. I just read an article. That's so funny that you mentioned this because I just read an article with a woman saying that, yes, and, and she made the argument. I was the one taking care of her. That's my right. two brothers weren't around, and guess what? The two brothers don't speak to her. They're like, you've taken everything. That's not what mom intended. And just to have had, yep. <laughs> like you said, have that conversation. That's and right. they were like, you wouldn't put mom in the nursing home because you wanted all our That's assets. That's right. And pretty soon we're in the, you know, you've got me representing somebody. We're in a deposition and we're talking about who got what on their 16th birthday. I mean, it's, it's a lot of skeletons come yeah. back. So I will tell everybody, PSA announcement. If you make a joint account with joint owners, you are creating an asset that will pass on survivorship automatically outside of your will. So make sure that's what you and your parent wants to do. You can add somebody to a bank account without making them a co-owner. They can be an authorized signer. They can be an authorized representative to speak to the bank. Or you can use a power of attorney. You do not have to create joint bank accounts. It's definitely more convenient. But there's a huge consequence on the back end that, that we see cause fights all the time. Yeah. So PSA announcement. Just everybody needs to be aware about that, about joint bank accounts. Um, back on the conservatorship. <laughs> front, okay. the, the hardest part of the conservatorship and guardianship thing, and this is also true when we talk about somebody who's a power of attorney or an executor of, this, of the estate, that person's a fiduciary. And a fiduciary means that you have a relationship of trust and confidence over another person. And you have to put their welfare ahead of your own. And it's, it's a very hard spot to be in. And what we see a lot is people who are in those fiduciary roles get conflicted very easy. And I'll give you the easiest one. A power of attorney or a uh, guardian or a conservator that has a, a, a power over their ward and uh, they're a fiduciary. And the person needs in-home care. And rather than put them in an in-home care facility, they think, well, I could just have mom here with me. Mm -hmm. Now, mom would be more comfortable if we renovated the basement, right? Right. So let's use mom's money to renovate our basement. Right. Okay? And, And maybe that was an okay decision. And then the rationalizing starts. And here pretty soon I see, well, mom has groceries. And so when I go to the grocery store, I'm using mom's money at the grocery store or mom's money to put gas in the car. Right. And it walks forward, and pretty soon, and I've seen, well, you know, the caregiver that comes every day gets paid $15 an hour, and she's here from 9 in the morning till 6 at night, but from 6 at night to 9 in the morning, I'm here. So why shouldn't I get $15 an hour? Exactly. And I've seen that rationalization walk forward, and pretty soon the guardian or conservator has themselves in a good bit of trouble because they violated that fiduciary role, whether it's as an, a conservator, an executor, a uh, power of attorney, any of those roles that they've had. But who would kind of bring that up? I so mean, how do those cases come that's up? What, that's what we talk about. Usually it's another child. Exactly. Uh, usually it's a sibling. Yes. Um, it can be adult protective services. It can be the probate court itself. Guardians and conservators, you've seen this in Brittany's case, guardians and, and conservators have to file reports back with the court because the court is the ultimate overseer. Mm -hmm. In Cobb, it's Judge Kelly Walk, uh, and Kelly is the overseer of these estates. And so they review very carefully the reports, and if they see something that looks out of line, if they see payments that are back to the, the fiduciary, they can call you in. They can issue a citation and say, we need you to explain this to us. What's going on here? If something's out of balance, Mm -hmm. they can bring you into court and say, we need you to explain yourself. Why, are, why is the account out of balance? Mm-hmm. 
Um, the conservator and the guardian each have to submit a budget to the court and say, here's what I think I'm going to spend this year, and if you're going to go outside that budget, uh, they need to know about it. So they're kind of the watchdog for it, but usually the whistleblower is a is another family member yes. who starts to see things happening and, and starts to complain. Because we've certainly seen in the news here, I don't know if you've followed this or seen it, but you know, people that are supposed to be taking care of elderly people in their home, and then you see that the people are just completely abused and they're taking their checks and everything. Yeah, in, in, in fact, um, and I actually just got a similar question on the on the feed in here. Or oh, directly I'm sorry. <laughs> to, 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 it was to my messenger. Yeah, Some, somebody messaged, good. messaged I me I want people question. to ask questions. And it was along the same lines. Yes. What do we do if, we, if we're if we afraid of this? It's the question. What, what can I do if I'm afraid that this is happening? And of course, one, contact an attorney. But two, uh, there's a, now a division in Cobb County um, in the district attorney's office, and uh, they started this several years ago because of the high frequency of uh, these incidents, and they now actually have an elder fraud division within the Cobb County district attorney's office and within the Cobb County sheriff's office and Cobb County police department. Um, and you can absolutely go to any one of those agencies and report it uh, if you have any reason to su suspect anybody's being physically, uh, obviously physically That's abused. so good. And people need to know. And they need to advertise that. People know. Because I do think when you hear about some woman who's abusing, like, all these people in her basement, people had to see something. That's right. And, and people need to be able to go and report that. And you can do so, of course, anonymously through, the, uh, through any of those agencies. Good. But likewise, as, as people become aware of scams and people become aware of um, you know, things that are, if someone's taking advantage of an elderly person, they need to take those to those relevant agencies. Obviously, they'd rather you not, you know, if you get the email telling you you won the lottery in Nigeria, um, you probably don't need to report that to them. They're already aware that that's right. circulating. Um, but these things pop up. Um, tax time is a very frequent one. You know, there's these IRS scam calls that go out to the elderly, um, and, and they always have to put out a warning about that. There's a jury one that goes around. Just so everybody knows, you will never, ever, ever get an email from the Cobb County Courthouse about jury duty. It will always come in a formal mail document called a summons. The jury administrator is never going to blast out emails to anyone. <laughs> so don't ever fall for, for there's kind of a jury scam out there that tells people they've been fined. I didn't not, know that. Yeah, it tells them they've been fined for not showing up for jury duty and, and that they're subject to penalties and they need to send in money for, for a penalty. Put so it on a gift card. Put it on a gift card, <laughs> yeah. So don't, please don't fall for that. Um, but it really is a complex time and it's, there are a lot of people out there taking advantage of people. And so it's important for people to understand the, the different vehicles that are out there. And, and it, look, if Brittany's situation does anything to help folks have a conversation about this, what is a conservatorship, what is a guardianship, when do we need one, how can it be taken advantage of? If, if she does that for, for this country and for people in this country, that'll be a remarkable accomplishment. You've had a lot more questions about it, right? Since all this happened, oh, right? Oh, nonstop. Yeah, people have come up to me. I, you know, it, Lawyers are kind of bad. We're like doctors at a cocktail party, right? If you tell somebody you're a doctor at a cocktail party, the first thing you do is you want to say, can you look at something? <laughs> Lawyer, lawyers are kind of the same way. Um, you know, when, you, when you're at a cocktail party or somebody and they never worry about what kind of lawyer you are. You, just, right. you know, the first thing you get is, tell me what's going on about this. So this is the new one, obviously, when somebody hears that we're in a, that I'm an attorney or that I do, you know, probate or people that know me come up to me and, what in the heck is this deal with Britney Spears? And, uh, you, you know, it's good. It, it, uh, it started a conversation about, you know, what we should do with, with uh, these situations. And, and it's also helping talk about the, the perspective on mental health and mental health conservatorships and guardianships, because we do see those. We have people that have to go to Ridgeview, uh, and, you know, they may need a short-term conservatorship or guardianship, um, and usually that's a parent-child, right? We've got a child who struggled with addiction, or mental health issues, and the parent is having to put them under a guardianship or conservatorship to help get them the help that they need and help monitor that, that situation and kind of protect them from themselves because they are off their medication or they're, you know, making decisions that are, that are not good for themselves or, you know, they don't understand their, their, if they're truly in a psychotic episode, they don't understand they're deluded, they're paranoid, they're in a schizophrenic state, a manic state, they don't understand their money. They don't understand their assets. They don't understand what they're doing. 
uh, in those states quite often, though. I mean, they'll do manic things because they, you know, they'll buy a car because some voice told them to. And yeah. Those really sad situations with parents. And I think a lot of, we see a lot of cases where parents have struggled through that, uh, trying to manage it without the intervention of the courts, without the intervention. And it's, of, it's very difficult. Very difficult and very heartbreaking. Yes. And, you know, the parents struggling with when to help and when to give up, and, and we see that time and time again. And they don't think of the, the guardianship, conservatorship route as a solution because they, in our heads, that's for grandma, right? Yeah. yeah. And so they need to understand that that can be an avenue as well to ha- help yeah. gain control and, and get that person in a situation where, and, and if, if the Brittany case proves out to be an example, it's one where maybe the person gets the help they need, their assets get secured, you know, they, and then when they regain their mental capacity and regain an understanding that transitions back away from the guardianship and conservatorship to back to, the, to them. So, you know, it'll be an interesting thing to follow in that regard and see if the conversation nationally, you know, works in that direction. I'm curious, and you may have covered this, I, I, but I didn't get it if you did. In Georgia, could you have a conservatorship that is as strict as what she you is could. under? You yes. could. You okay. um, could. Where they're literally now, you know, the, the discussions about intervention into her uh, personal rights, her ability to have a child, her ability to, to, to do some of those things are restrictive beyond anything I've ever seen. If, if those statements from her are true, um, you know, then that is a very intrusive, very invasive um, thing. And I, I don't see that would, that that would happen in any of the probate courts that I've, I've operated in. Again, because we've gone away from a decision that she's capable of making that might be a bad decision versus whether or not she's capable of understanding and making that decision. And, you know, I, I don't, the, the intrusive rights on the guardianship that we have in Georgia, the most intrusive ones are taking away their right to vote. Oh, you know? wow. And that's one that the courts really try to avoid. You know, can we at least let them preserve their right to vote? Of course, the right to own a firearm. Uh, you know, there's, there's constitutional protections in there. Um, by the same token, I had a tragic case out in Conyers, Georgia, involving a guardianship and conservatorship, and that guy did not need to own firearms anymore. Um, right. He was very old and very demented and very delusional and, mm-hmm. was, I mean, was shooting at people um, because he thought they were, they dark, were coming Yeah, to, paranoia to and that kind of thing. And he right. didn't need to have a gun right. anymore. Um, so, you know, those are very restrictive. Um and the courts look very carefully at that. How, you know, they want to ask the question, how can I put this in place in the least offensive manner to the person? Not, yeah. not the most, but the least offensive manner to the person yeah. that's under their care. And how do we monitor that? And the, and the, ward, the ward gets appointed an attorney, and the ward gets appointed uh, a guardian ad litem. So there are people in there advocating for the person, even if they can't speak for themselves. Um, Brittany's case is a little odd, obviously, because not only is she capable of speaking for herself, she's capable of speaking to hundreds of millions of people for herself. Yeah. So she has a big voice. A lot of times in these cases where you deal with somebody under a severe mental impairment, a severe dementia, severe physical impairment, they can't advocate for themselves. Yeah. They, they don't know what's going on. They're completely lost. They're completely delusional. And... You know, they do still get a ward appointed guardian ad litem and an attorney that will come in and advocate for their rights and their situation That's and what's good. best for them. Yeah. And so our system really does look out for all sides of it. Uh, people just need to kind of understand it and be able to utilize it, utilize it correctly uh, and, and make sure that everything's done the way it's supposed to be done. The way it's well, like you said, I think the big takeaway is that this is something that almost all of us will face at some point in our lives, you know, even if it's a parent or a relative or even a child. So it's good to at least have that conversation. That's right. So yeah, the, it is old, starting a lot of good conversations. Yeah, right the, old, the old saying is father time is undefeated. Uh, yeah. And we're all going to get there. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will all cross these uh, bridges with ourselves, with our parents, grandparents, um, and, and maybe even children. And so they're conversations that the public needs to continue to have. Yeah, this is all really good in the end. Sure. I just hope things work out well for her. Thank you for joining us. And Justin is here every 
what is it, second Friday, second Friday of the month at 8 o'clock in the morning to answer your questions. Hope you have a great day.